Uh, our next speaker is Donna Alexander from the Association for Civil Rights in Israel. She has spent her legal career in human rights since joining ACRI as staff attorney in 1993. As an attorney, she specializes in the rights of the mentally ill, migrant workers, and the rights of Palestinian Bedouin in the Negev. Following a two-year fellowship at the Mandel School for Educational Leadership since 2003, she's directed the ACRI legal department. She has a bachelor's degree in philosophy from Yale and her law degree from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Her talk today is on reflections of a human rights organization in a traditional society. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to speak in about, about an experiment that takes um, some of the themes that Nisim and many spoke about and tries to explore how they may influence the actual practice of a human rights organization. This is an experiment which is still going on, so unfortunately, I won't be able to report to you its results today. We at ACRI have been trying for the past few years to understand why, why we are failing in our deepest mission, which is to create a human rights ethos in Israeli society. We awakened to the need to enter a process of critical self-reflection during and after the military operation in, in Gaza um, at the end of 19, uh, sorry, at the end of uh, 2008, Oferti At that time, we witnessed a complete unwillingness by the Jewish Israeli public to tolerate dissenting opinions protesting the war on Gaza. We saw the same intolerance this summer and during Tsuketan, but this time we were not surprised. At the end of 19, uh, sorry, at the end of 2008, we were taken by surprise news editors telling our spokesperson outright that they did not want our point of view represented on the panel, and quiet, harmless protests being dispersed by the police, and protesters arrested and indicted with no legal basis. <coughs> the most trivial human right, freedom of speech in its mildest form, turned out to be unprotected and unrecognized even by the so-called free press. Jewish-Israeli society became one solidary bloc, with no place for dissenting voices, and certainly with no wish to hear about human rights. Following that, we had the Goldstone Committee, the public campaign against human rights organizations, and the long line of, an, of anti-democratic legislation ap attempts, some of which were successful, which has not stopped since. And blatant racism against Palestinians on both sides of the Green Line is consistently on the rise. These years have demonstrated very clearly to us the fragility of pub public support in Israel for human rights organizations and actually for the human rights discourse itself. Human rights organizations don't need to be popular. They never will be. The role is to criticize government and society and that, never, that will never make one popular. But for their criticism to be effective, human rights discourse needs to be seen as, a legitim as legitimate as part of, a, of the collective effort to build a better society. We came to the realization that for wide segments of Israeli society, human rights discourse and organizations are viewed as a destructive force, as a force that threatens the collective, the Jewish collective. We came to the realization that we are working in a bubble. We are speaking to ourselves, we are very convincing to ourselves and to those like us. We are winning legal, legal victories here and there, some of them very important. But we are having ver a very slight influence on the deeper level of Israeli society at large, on the ethos. ACRI was established by, in the 1970s by lawyers, some of them coming from the Anglo-American tradition, and its model was the ACLU. It seems that the existence of a liberal human rights ethos in society was taken for granted. What happened in 2008 and after opened our eyes to the seemingly, today seemingly obvious fact that this was an illusion, perhaps created by the mostly, li li mostly liberal legal system. In fact, Israel is a largely traditional society. Most Jewish Israelis come from non-liberal traditions, and most of the Arab population is traditional. In 2009, Nisim joined the ACRI Board of Directors and, and gave academic and empirical support from his research to our realization that we were losing in the long-term public sphere, even if winning short-term, short-lived legal victories. His research encouraged us to, to undertake a deeper, deeper critical process, to try to understand what it is about human rights discourse which makes it so unpopular or irrelevant, 
especially for traditional populations who are potentially its greatest benefactors, as they often belong to the weaker and more marginalized, marginalized parts of society. The strategy we adopted was to take one such group and open, with, open a direct dialogue with them. This was a really novel part of the experiment and completely not trivial. Human rights organizations are used to speaking to the public in a very authoritative and critical mm -hmm. tone. Or in, a, in an educational context, we engage in dialogue, but with a clear agenda to persuade. This was to be an experiment in speaking with our critics in a candid and real effort to understand their view on human rights discourse and their difficulties with it. And with the understanding that this dialogue may lead us to change in a way we could not predict in advance. The dialogue group formed with the help and guidance of Shacharit considered, consisted of representatives from the liberal camp, mostly from Acre, and from representatives from the Mizrahi traditional camp which in the end, although this was not planned, um, those representing the, the traditional camp were, were Haredim, ultra-Orthodox educators, associated with Shas and with its educational network, Maya Nachinu Chatoroni. For over two years, we met regularly, around four times a year, four or five times a year, and the process was fascinating, even dramatic. We actually held our closing meeting last week. The meetings began with a deep distrust on the part of the Haredi group towards us, the ultra-Orthodox group, and a mutual sense of a deep chasm that lies between us. But slowly we built a dialogue based on trust, on candor, and on a willingness to engage and to speak about some of the most controversial issues between us. I don't have the time here to describe in detail the process that occurred in this group, and that's not the subject of this talk. I do want to speak about some of the insights that we brought from this dialogue and the challenge of taking these insights and incorporating them into our human rights work. The dialogue made us sharply aware of our particular identity and as was reflected very clearly by our, by our partners to the dialogue and the limitations it brings. Our identity, as again, as, as was very clearly reflected um, is very far from being universal. We are mostly secular, well-educated, upper-middle-class Ashkenazi Jews with a minority of secular, well-educated, upper-middle-class Arabs. This identity brings with it a, a large blind spots and limitations, even handicaps. First of all, our sociological similarity to the legal, political, and economic elites whom we see, whom we see ourselves as challenging um, associates us completely with this elite in the eyes of marginalized groups and creates a distrust of our motives. Secondly, our particular social placement creates blind spots which of course influence our agenda, which human rights violations we address and which violations don't even reach our knowledge. We are not neutral in our agenda and this is very clear to others, much less so to us. But most importantly, our identity as secular cosmopolitan liberals and our universal language of human rights makes it very difficult to us to engage with large sectors of society. Our strongest foundation, the liberal ideology itself, is also a handicap. Human rights discourse disclaimed, uh, claims universality. We claim to know how a good society should look, a good a society good for everyone, not only for us. Aside from this position being seen as arrogant and patronizing, it also makes unbased assumptions about the very society we aim to reform. Our liberal language assumes the acceptance of the central concept of individual rights. That is our starting point. But this kind of discourse completely fails to engage with the traditional worldview, which sees the centrality of the collective and loyalty to the, to the collective or with a religious worldview which speaks in terms of duties and not rights. What the dialogue made clear to us was that only when we stepped down from the podium of universality, only when we agreed to recognize the partiality of our position and did not claim to have a monopoly on knowing what is right and just, only then could we really begin to engage. And through this engagement, we discovered 
surprisingly wide areas of agreement on values, and even on positions regarding concrete issues we discussed, although the justification and the language were very different. But the purpose of the dialogue was not to reach agreement, but to seek the conditions under which human rights discourse can engage with traditional values and be recognized as a legitimate moral stance to be reckoned with. What seemed to come out of our experience in the dialogue was that one major condition for such engagement is to recognize the partiality of the moral position of human rights and to recognize that, as opposed to its purported universality, it is actually a particular position alongside other particular moral positions which are no less, if not more, attractive. The question we have to ask ourselves as a, as a human rights organization is whether this is, a, whether this is a condition that we can accept. Can a human rights organization function and fulfill its critical role while acknowledging the relativity or the partiality of its moral position and discourse? Posing this question on an organizational level is a critical reflective process that takes time and raises many dilemmas and difficulties. We have only begun this process at ACRI, and so at this point I can say more about the dilemmas and the challenges than about their resolution. In, the, in addition to the organizational challenges, the process we began at ACRI surfaced two main substantive dilemmas. One is regarding the universalist nature of human rights discourse, which requires it to be detached from association with any particular group identity or culture and to claim universal applica application. On the one hand, this universalism or neutrality is at the core of the human rights ideology and does not appear to be compromisable. The universal universalistic discourse is also what keeps a human rights organization like ACRI together allowing people from different national and cultural identities to work together with a common ideology and language. On the other hand, the universalistic discourse is legalistic and sterile and unable to recognize deep feelings of group, group loyalty, which are so dominant in Israeli, in Israeli society. And it appears to be inconsistent with a critical and relativistic approach to human rights. The other major challenge concerns the social function of a human rights organization, which seems to require it to take definitive judgmental positions based on the knowledge of what is right for society at large. But this kind of authoritative stance does not seem, to seem compatible with recognizing the legitimacy of alternative worldviews regarding the social and political ideal, especially those which emphasize group loyalty. I want to conclude by opening to question some of the assumptions I just made. Firstly, the assumption that a human rights organization must, must, base, must base itself exclusively on universalistic rights discourse. I would like us to consider the possibility of shifting the emphasis of our discourse from individual rights to underlying values. Such a shift could open possibilities of agreeing on just solutions that are morally acceptable to different groups without agreeing necessarily on the rights justification. It could also allow for a duties-based approach which speaks to religious discourse. Secondly, I want to question the assumption that in order to be effective and convincing, the human rights organization must speak with one authoritative voice. The assumption, this assumption has actually not proven itself. Moreover, it does not completely agree with our recognition, our internal recognition amongst us that often the human rights doctrine does not lead to one definitive answer. In other words, we, we human rights activists know that this is true, that human rights does not always lead to one answer, but, the, but the, what we present to the outside world is that it does. Okay, we present one position. Perhaps speaking in a more pluralist, less orthodox voice, and one that is aware of its particularity, may be more effective in making our position heard and legitimate. And a final word on modesty. Modesty, or humility, is usually associated with the religious worldview. In our meetings with the Shas group, the dramatic turning point occurred in the second meeting, in the second part of the second meeting, when two of us 
from APRI presented the, or presented the organization to the group and opened before them our dilemmas, our doubts, our failures, and our question marks. This presentation was met with nothing, nothing less than shock. Our, our partners to the dialogue, our Haredi partners, had apparently been under the impression that human rights advocates were incapable, incapable of expressing uncertainty, of not being always right, of modesty. I wonder what on earth could have given, given them that impression. <laughs> From that point on, trust began to be formed and the dialogue could, begin, uh, could, be, be, could become candid, deep, and productive. So I want to suggest that modesty, deep ideological modesty, may be a path worth exploring as a way for human rights discourse to gain legitimacy and effectiveness in Israeli society. We can continue to believe, as I do, that the vision we have of the ideal society is the one which will bring about the most human prosperity, peace, and happiness. But at the same time, we know that others are in deep disagreement with us about this vision and that we will probably not convince them. And they are not a small minority in our society. They may even be the majority. And we need their co cooperation, or at, at least we need them to recognize our moral position as legitimate in order to have any chance of advancing our vision and making those social and legal changes that we think necessary for reforming society. If we don't find the way to engage with, traditional society, with, which, with the traditional society in which we live and its values, I'm afraid human rights discourse in Israel may be doomed to become more and more esoteric and ineffective. So to end on, a, on, a, on an optimistic note, I do hope that we do meet the challenge and that we dare to take this path of engagement. Thank you.